Welcome to part 10 of this series on Moby Dick. In this lecture, we will discuss chapters 55 through 65. In chapter 55, Ishmael discusses the inadequacy of whale paintings. The great Leviathan is that one creature in the world which must remain unpainted to the last. True, one portrait may hit the mark much nearer than another, but none can hit it with any very considerable degree of exactness. So there is no earthly way of finding out precisely what the whale really looks like. And the only mode in which you can derive even a tolerable idea of his living contour is by going a-whaling yourself. But by so doing, you run no small risk of being eternally stove and sunk by him. Wherefore, it seems to me you had best not be too fastidious in your curiosity touching this Leviathan. This passage supports Melville's empiricism. Melville believes that one gains knowledge of something by experience, not through second-hand accounts or metaphysical speculations. In chapter 56, Ishmael discusses some of the paintings that provide the best depictions of whales. The best paintings, in his opinion, are the works of a French painter named Garnery. Ishmael wonders why the French are especially good at capturing the essence of the whale through art, considering the fact that France is not a whaling nation. Who Garnery the painter is or was, I know not. But my life for it, he was either practically conversant with his subject, or else marvelously tutored by some experienced whaleman. The French are the lads for painting action. In chapter 57, Ishmael discusses the various places that one can see whales besides the ocean. For example, men have fashioned all sorts of objects into the form of whales, weather vanes, door knockers, knife handles, etc. And in the case of the experienced whaleman, he can see whales in certain constellations in the night sky and in certain features of physical landscapes. This chapter demonstrates that monomania afflicts not only Ahab but regular people. Just as whalemen see whales regardless of whether they are near water, so too do other people see and dream about the certain distinguishing characteristics of their own occupations. In chapter 58, Ishmael contrasts the land and sea. While mankind has bent the land to its will through advancements in agriculture and technology, it will never be able to completely subdue the sea. However baby man may brag of his science and skill, and however much in a flattering future that science and skill may augment, Yet forever and forever, to the crack of doom, the sea will insult and murder him, and pulverize the stateliest, stiffest frigate he can make. As the sea is unconquerable, so too are many metaphysical questions unanswerable. We may never know for certain whether God exists and whether there is life after death. In the novel, the sea represents all that is mysterious in life. In chapter 59, Dagu believes that he spots Moby Dick. The boats are lowered, and the crew chase after the white mass. However, when they reach the object, they discover that it is a giant squid. Whatever superstitions the sperm whalemen in general have connected with the sight of this object, certain it is that a glimpse of it being so very unusual, that circumstance has gone far to invest it with portentousness. In chapter 60, Ishmael describes the whale line which is secured to each harpoon. The line is wrapped around the boat, and when a harpoon is thrown into a whale, the line whizzes out of the boat, endangering the sailors. Ishmael states that all men are surrounded by dangerous metaphorical whale lines. All men live enveloped in whale lines. All are born with halters round their necks. But it is only when caught in the swift, sudden turn of death that mortals realize the silent, subtle, ever-present perils of life. This is a profound insight about human nature. People live blissfully unaware of death until they encounter it themselves, and only then do they fully appreciate the gift of life. In chapter 61, Queequeg tells Ishmael that he believes the sight of a squid is a good omen, contrary to the common opinion of other whalemen. He believes that a squid is an indication that sperm whales are nearby. Indeed, the crew of the Pequod spies a sperm whale. They lower the boats and chase it. Stubbs' boat crew successfully kills the whale. Melville's description of the whale's death is shocking. The red tide now poured from all sides of the monster like brooks down a hill. His tormented body rolled not in brine but in blood, which bubbled and seethed for furlongs behind in their wake, and all the while jet after jet of white smoke was agonizingly shot from the spiracle of the whale. At last, gush after gush of clotted red gore, as if it had been the purple lees of red wine, shot into the frighted air, and falling back again, ran dripping down his motionless flanks into the sea. His heart had burst. In chapter 62, Ishmael argues that the modern method of harpooning a whale is inefficient. Currently, the harpooner rows along with the rest of the crew until the boat is close enough to throw the harpoon. 
at which point the harponeer jumps to his feet and immediately throws the harpoon. This often leads to missed throws and unsuccessful chases. Ishmael advises a new system. The headsman should stay in the bows from first to last. He should both dart the harpoon and the lance, and no rowing whatever should be expected of him, except under circumstances obvious to any fisherman. I know that this would sometimes involve a slight loss of speed in the chase, but long experience in various whalemen of more than one nation has convinced me that in the vast majority of failures in the fishery it has not by any means been so much the speed of the whale as the before-described exhaustion of the harpooner that has caused them. In chapter 63, Ishmael identifies another problem with the current method of hunting whales. Currently, the whale line is attached to two harpoons. If the first harpoon throw should fail, then the harpooner can quickly grab the second harpoon and try again. However, when one harpoon successfully strikes a whale, the other must be cast into the sea. When the second iron is thrown overboard, it thenceforth becomes a dangling, sharp-edged terror, skittishly curvetting about both boat and whale, entangling the lines or cutting them, and making a prodigious sensation in all directions. Nor, in general, is it possible to secure it again until the whale is fairly captured and a corpse. In chapter 64, Stubb orders the cook to cook him a steak from a piece of the whale that he killed. While Stubb eats the whale steak, the crew listens to the sharks eat the whale tied to the ship. The analogy between mankind and sharks is obvious. About midnight, that steak was cut and cooked, and lighted by two lanterns of sperm oil, Stubb stoutly stood up to his spermaceti supper at the capstan head, as if that capstan were a sideboard. Nor was Stubb the only banqueter on whale's flesh that night mingling their mumblings with his own mastications, thousands on thousands of sharks swarming round the dead leviathan smackingly feasted on its fatness. The few sleepers below in their bunks were often startled by the sharp slapping of their tails against the hole within a few inches of the sleeper's hearts. In chapter 65, Ishmael remarks that many people consider eating whale meat taboo, but Ishmael demonstrates their hypocrisy. No doubt the first man that ever murdered an ox was regarded as a murderer, Perhaps he was hung, and if he had been put on his trial by oxen, he certainly would have been, and he certainly deserved it if any murderer does. Go to the meat market of a Saturday night and see the crowds of live bipeds staring up at the long rows of dead quadrupeds. Does not that sight take a tooth out of the cannibal's jaw? Cannibals, who's not a cannibal? I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the Fiji that salted down a lean missionary in his cellar against a coming famine. It will be more tolerable for that provident Fiji, I say, in the day of judgment, than for thee, civilized and enlightened gourmand, who nailest geese to the ground and feastest on their bloated livers in thy pot de foie gras. Don't forget to subscribe and join us for part 11 of this series on Moby Dick.